Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of John. Uh, we're going to begin with uh, chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, now, if you have not seen the previous studies on the book of John, they are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Uh, I believe the book of John is the most important book in the entire Bible. And uh, the first chapter and the third chapter particularly are make two of the most important chapters in the whole Bible. So please go back and watch it from the beginning. And uh, uh, before we get started, I'll, I'll ask um, Brother Eric and Brother Steve to introduce themselves. Hello, it's me again, Dalmo. And Brother Luke, I agree with you. Uh, but, uh, the book of John is so important, I decided to go ahead and memorize half of it. Okay, back to you. Hey, everybody. Brother Stephen here. Hopefully my camera's working a little bit better and you can see me tonight. But Stephen here. Also, I go by Stephen Rivers TV here on YouTube. And I definitely have to agree. The book of John is definitely my favorite book of the Bible and the most important because it definitely talks about, you know, believing in Jesus to be saved. But I'll present that later on. Okay, yeah, Brother Stephen, your camera's working fine tonight. It's nice to be able to see your face again. All right, uh, let's go get right into it. Well, I... I'm a KJV firstist, so I'll read it first in the KJV, and then we'll look at it also in the Amplified. And that might be helpful. Verse 4 of chapter 4, and he must needs go through Samaria. Well, I better go with chap verse 3. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Just therefore, uh, Jesus therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Okay, let's stop there and discuss that before we go further. Um, anything stand out to you uh, in those verses? Yes, Brother Luke, I love how uh, the author phrased it. He must needs go through Samaria. Uh, that's just amazing. Uh, obviously, somebody had an appointment with him. Okay, back to you. Stephen, you still with us? Oh, sorry, I must have been muted. Um, sorry about that. Okay, but anyway, what I just said was, yes, I definitely agree with what Brother Eric just said, but um, if anything really jumps out at me, I guess in this is in verse six where it says, you know, Jesus, you know, is being weary for his journey, you know, being tired. It just also reminds me that, you know, at the same time. He is fully God, but at the same time, you know, he's also, you know, fully man, you know, come in the flesh. As it said, the word became flesh. And this just, it just stands out to me because, like, you would think that, like, he's, you know, he's God. So, like, you would think he would never get tired, but it's showing that he's also taking on, you know, the form of human. But then again, this is actually great because of what's about to happen, but I won't spoil that just yet. Okay, I'm... I'm pretty sure you've read this before. Uh, yeah, I also, uh, it stood out to me also, the statement that he grew weary, he was tired. So we, you know, the, one of the doctrines of the church, of course, is that um, Jesus is fully God, and yet he's also fully man. So that's the kind of thing that is uh, like studying the, the triunity of the Godhead, uh, the, the Trinity is, is, we try to explain these things the best we can, but some things are beyond our understanding. We do. 
Um, and I think this is also a difficult thing to understand. How could he be fully God and yet fully man? And yet I believe it and I accept it. Uh, the other thing that stood out to me there was the, the statement that um, it was says um, uh, it was near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And you probably remember in the study last night in Proverbs we're talking about uh, I forgot how it was phrased in the verse, but it's talking about like a sign landmark. It was saying a landmarks, and we're discussing the the, the purpose of landmarks. And they used to always do that, but they were very, very careful about remembering where everything happened. And a lot of things that happened were they would put a stack of stones up as a monument or a landmark to, to memorialize all these things that happened. So it's, uh, it's not surprising to me that they would make a point of saying, describing this was right near this place where uh, Jacob gave this land to, to Joseph. Uh, I'm going to read it in the Amplified, but anything you want to add before I go into it in the Amplified? That was great, guys. And I especially like the part about the landmarks. Being in the third day of Hanukkah, I consider Hanukkah to be a landmark of sorts. If everybody only knew the story behind it, our Lord also himself celebrated this event. Happy Hanukkah! Okay, back to you. Well, I mean, I definitely like that connection because I didn't think about that. You know, I've, that's never crossed my mind when reading this verse before. But, yeah, because this really, you know, because Jesus is about to really use this, at least at this time in this location. He's about to, you know, well, talk about, well, you know what, nope, not spoiling it yet. Okay, well, let's look at this in the Amplified. I just looked at it while you were talking there, and something surprised me. Uh, in verse 3, I'll start. It says, He left Judea and returned again to Galilee. Uh, now he had to go through Samaria, so he arrived at a Samaritan town called Sychar, near the tract of land that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph, and Jacob, Jacob's well was there. Uh, oh yeah, here it is. So Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, uh, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which is noon. Okay. All right, I'll go on now in, in the Amplified. Uh, verse 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. All right. I'll wait for your reaction to that. I'm not very familiar with the Samaritans. But I highly suspect that they were regarded just like our own Mexicans, whom I love very much. Okay, back to you. Yeah, back in those days, I mean, the Jews, this, it's like the Jews and the Gentiles. They just really didn't have anything to do with each other, which, you know, it was a, which, you know is why Jesus talked about, you know, the Good Samaritan. Two people of, you know, the Samaritan, hold on. Oh, no, two people of the, the fallen guys' own faith ignored him. But while the Samaritan, the supposed enemy, was the one to save them, like they were, they didn't like each other very much. But of course, the real thing that's about to lead to the important message is when Jesus said, you know, give me to drink. That's about to turn to something, you know, amazing up in the next couple of verses up ahead. Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad you're being. Uh careful to not jump ahead too much. That's very good restraint on your part. You're learning from studying Proverbs all these virtues like restraint. Uh, now, first of all, it says uh, uh, a woman from Samaria and uh, she says, how is it that you uh, 
you're since you're a Jew, you're asking me, of a Samaritan woman. The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Well, first of all, what is a Samaritan? Uh, a Samaritan is probably even lower than a Gentile because uh, a Samaritan is the result of Jews and Gentiles uh, intermarrying. Uh, a Samaritan is part Jew, part Gentile. So they are really, uh, the Jews are very uh, uh, prejudiced uh, people. They, they don't want to associate with Gentiles. This was a problem. When we, when we study early church history on that study, you know, uh, uh, we went into it quite deeply, the fact that uh, the Jews did not want to associate with the Gentiles. Um, and in the book of Acts, of course, that was one of the shocking things that uh, when they discovered that Peter had preached to Gentiles, the Cornelius and his family, it was shocking. He, they, they were not supposed to associate with Gentiles at all. They were very, um, what's the word? Uh, they, uh, they, they wouldn't associate with them. They, they, they stayed away, away from them. But, and, and so that's why this woman is so surprised when Jesus is actually talking to her. They, you know, not, you don't have anything to them. You don't even talk to a, a non-Jew, a Gentile, much less a Samaritan, which is like a step below a Gentile, because they, that's the result of Jews and Gentiles mixing together. So uh, I'll read it in the Amplified, but first let me see if you want to say anything about that. Now, guys, uh, some people will like to accuse God of teaching the Jews to be racist, but he didn't. Uh, God provided for the strangers among the Jews in the law and all the laws regarding non-Jews that were given by God to the Jews were much more kind and gracious than anything any other nation had at that time. Okay, back to you. Uh, for these verses, I don't have any additional comments as of right now. Well, let me let me add to uh, Brother Eric's uh, thoughts there that uh, when I say that the Jews were very prejudiced people, and um, I'm, I'm, if you can think of the right word, tell me where you, you keep yourself separate from other people. Uh, but it, it, it was God's instructions for them to do that. It wasn't just some, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Jacob, Jacob who became Israel, and he had the twelve sons and the twelve tribes of Israel. And it, it's not that, that Israel just thought of this and decided that. No, it was it was instructed. It was instructions given to Moses that all those people should uh, not mix with other peoples. And the reason they didn't want them, God didn't want them to mix is because he didn't want them bringing their false religions in and messing up the religion that, that uh, Moses received. So they were not supposed to associate with them. Uh, Brother Stephen was interjecting something. What were you saying? I said you mean segregate? Like keep separate? That's the word. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, they were they were actually uh, supposed to segregate, and it was God's desire that they segregate. And the purpose wasn't because God hated Gentiles; He loves everybody. But the purpose was He didn't want them to mix because He knew. And it, unfortunately, though, throughout history they continued mixing. And every time they mixed, like Abraham, um, what what did he do? He had a child with with the handmaiden Hagar, who was Egyptian. And the result was that was the child that was not intended. Uh, I, Isaac was the, the promised son for Abraham and Sarah, but Sarah and Abraham lost patience and didn't believe God, lost their faith that God would keep their promise because they were old. And, and in, so she said Abraham to go have a sex with, with the handmaiden, and they mixed. They mixed. They weren't supposed to mix. And what was the result? You had uh, Ishmael, and the same thing happened with uh, 
uh, Abraham, uh, Isaac had his sons, uh, Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the chosen line. Esau went and mixed with, with the, uh, people, not his family, and, and the result became the Moabites. And every time they, they went off on in a direction they weren't supposed to be, all these people end up resulting, the people in all over the Middle East now, who hate the Jews and want to kill them. They're, they're the Muslims now. The Arab and the Muslim peoples of the Middle East are all the result of Ishmael and Esau and their descendants. And it's because they disobeyed and they mixed. So God didn't want them to mix and he, because he didn't want their religion to be adulterated. So you want this, don't commit adultery. Uh, we, we know that committing adultery has to do with sexual intercourse outside of your marriage, but adultery also applies to uh, the purity of the, the Jewish people. When they mixed with other people, their race became adulterated or uh, impure. And um, so, uh, yeah, that was the, your word segregate. Uh, that's, the, that's the word we're looking for. But this was uh, instructed by God. I'm going to read it in the Amplified now. It says, um, He left Judea and returned again to Galilee. Oh, oh I already read that. Um, then a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone off into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman asked him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? For Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. Now there's a footnote here under Samaritan. Let me go down and see what it says. It says the Jews considered Samaritan women ceremonially unclean. Okay. All right. I'll go on now and continue reading in the KJV. Uh, picking up with um, verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith it to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. <laughs> that verse alone needs to be discussed. I won't go on to verse 11. Uh, go ahead and tell me about verse 10. Brother Luke, I'm not worthy to uh, expound on this just yet. I would like to hear from Stephen at this point. Well, I mean, I'm not really anything special, and I'm not really worthy either. But All right, here we go. Verse 10. You know, if thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. You know, the gift of God, you know, is salvation, you know, through Jesus. You know, and if she would have known, you know, that this is the Messiah talking to her, you know, all he would have had to have done all she would have had to have done was asked and he would have given her, you know, the gift of salvation. You know, like cause one thing is it's like a lot of people this time get confused by this because it's like she might be thinking that it's literally like some type of a water or some type of a drink, when in reality he's talking about, you know, the gift of, you know, everlasting life. And, you know, well, I'm not going to talk about future verses because we're going to get to them in only a matter of minutes. But it's just, yeah, all he's talking about basically here is just that gift of salvation. And if she, you know, if she would have, you know, been able to understand, you know, what that gift was and known who was talk, all she would have had to have done was just asked and believed, and she would have had the gift. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, uh, the term... The gift of God, is, is we read here. Um, I love the term. It's all, That exact same terminology appears in one of my favorite and most important verses is Romans 6, 23. It says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there it tells us exactly what the gift of God is, eternal life. Another way of phrasing it is life everlasting, 
another way. I'll ask you guys uh, if you can draw a distinction between the words uh, salvation and eternal life. But uh, I'll see how you do with that. But so he's uh, he's saying that if you just knew who I was, who who it is that's talking to you, you would have asked me to give you. Um, how is it phrased again? Let me see. It says, uh, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that say it, saith to thee, give me a drink, thou would have asked him and he would have given thee living water. So we got a term, interesting terms here, living water. We've got the term, the gift of God. And also the question, do you know who I am? And who it is that saith to thee? Do you know who you're talking to? So there's the subject of the identity of Jesus, the fact that this oh, he's using this term living water, and then also the term uh, uh, the gift of God. There's a lot of great uh, points that we could probably we could probably talk for an hour just on that one verse if we really wanted to string it out. Um, before I go to the amplified, uh, I want to see if you guys draw a distinction between uh, the gift of salvation and the gift of eternal life, or are they, are they uh, absolutely synonymous and interchangeable? Brother Luke, uh, I don't think I am ready to uh, expound on such a topic at this point, but I'm interested in hearing what you guys have to say about it. Oh boy. Well, I've never actually been asked to do this type of before, so this is a tough one, but here's my best crack. Well, I mean, salvation, you know, is, you know, being saved and being given the gift of eternal life. And, you know, an eternal life is, you know, as it's what it said, it's eternal. So it's something that you can't lose, like you cannot lose the gift. So like, Hmm. This is a, this is tough, but I feel like you know, eternal uh, life is like that. What? Well, I, I thought you when you said it was tough, you were giving up. I'll, I'll I, I was going to talk, but if you continue, go ahead. I'll let you do this for now. All right. I mean, if you're stumped on something, don't be embarrassed. Sometimes I tell you I'm stumped. What do you think? But and again, I'm speaking that I'm what I'm going to tell you now is my own conclusion. And you may or may not agree, but uh, when someone gets salvation, we know that they're going to go to heaven. They they have salvation. When they get salvation, they get eternal life. And uh, when they get eternal life, we know that they also get salvation. So it's it's really uh, you get it at the same time. But I think just if you look at the root of the words, then then they're they're really two different things you're receiving. And that's why I say when we believe in Jesus, we get three gifts. We, we, we get the gift of salvation, which is we're saved. What are you saved from? You're not saved from heaven. You're saved from hell. You're, you're, you're saved from condemnation. You're saved from the second death. If you get saved, it means you're saved from something bad that's happening, happening to you, and you get saved from it. Whereas when you receive the gift of eternal life, that, that, that means that that's referring to living forever in heaven. So there, I see a distinction between salvation, that means you're saved from going to hell, and eternal life means you get to go to heaven instead. And yet when you believe in Jesus, you get both of them. And then there's a third gift you get at the moment you believe, and that's the gift of the Holy Spirit that comes in and baptizes you, indwells you, and seals you, and then starts to transform you. So I think these are three gifts, and the word, uh, if you look at Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, For by grace are ye saved, so the subject of the, the, the verse is salvation. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So in that verse, we see that salvation is the gift. In Romans 6, 23, it says, The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So in this verse, we see that the gift is eternal life. 
And there's also a verse that says we're given the Holy Spirit when we believe. So when you're given something, it's a, it's a, we could say that the Holy Spirit is also a gift we get. Uh, so that's my distinction. But before we go on, I want to also ask you about the term living water and the when he says, also when he says, if you know who you're talking to. Okay, but first, let me see what you think of my distinction between salvation and, et and eternal life. What do I think? What? Here's what I think. If that don't put a smile on your face, I don't know what will. Okay. I like that, though. I like that, what you just said, because... Eternal life and salvation, you know, they're used very, very, you know, synonymously. That's a good, you know, perception, you know, thinking about, you know, B, you know, A, you're saved from hell, and then B, you're, you know, given, you know, eternal life in heaven. So it's like, I never really thought about that being two-parted, even though, even though I've always known you, you're being saved from hell, you just, I guess most people just never really seem to think about it being like a two-part thing. How, you know, A, you get saved from hell, you know, B, you get eternal life. You know, and well, I mean, I knew this part, but you know, and C, you get the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it seems pretty cool, you know, getting three gifts all in one. You know, getting, you know, with this gift that you know Jesus gives us, you know, just for believing. But very interesting, and you know, I definitely agree with it. It's just something I never really, you know, thought of or put into this perspective before. All right. Well, uh, the the thing that I want to make sure that we don't do, though, is even though I can see a distinction because the, the just the meanings of the words are different. But I also, uh, I don't want to give any impression that there is a series of events. It's, it all happens simultaneously. We get salvation, eternal life, and the Holy Spirit at the same instant we put our faith in Jesus. Now let me ask you, when he says, if you knew who you were talking to, what, do you, what is the significance of that statement? Wow, Brother Luke. If she knew, and she did come to know, and we all have come to know, and we pray that all will come to know. Okay, Stephen. All right. Well, well, first of all, before I give my comment there, you know, definitely, no one should ever get it confused that, you know, it all happens, you know, at the same time. It's three gifts, but... Yet, well, three, it's like three tiers, you said, but it's all one gift, though, that he gives you all three at the exact same time, and you're guaranteed it all, and, you're never, and you'll never lose any of it. But now, back to looking at who it is that saith unto me. You know, she's just saying a tired man, you know, and it's just some guy that she sees in front of her. You know, she doesn't know this is, you know, God in the flesh. She doesn't know that this is, you know, the Savior who's going to die on the cross for her and, you know, and pin all of it, you know, her sins onto him and, you know, grant everlasting life. So it's like she just doesn't, you know, understand. Like at this point, she just probably just doesn't have, you know, the eyes to see and the ears to hear at this point. But, you know, he's going to, you know, well, he's about to explain it to her, you know, right here. But pretty much it's just like, of course, Jesus is just amazing. You know, just being, you know, fully man and fully God. But it's just, it's just at this point, she just doesn't understand. You know, she just doesn't have that gift yet. But, you know, I'll stop talking about this for now because we're about to get into that more a little bit later. Um, all right, so the, um, the person that – we know, we know that she does come to the understanding and believing that he is uh, the promised one the one that they've been waiting for, the Messiah. Uh, now, maybe you can help me with this, because I just thought of this, and I, I, don't, I don't know uh, the answer, but uh, I know that the Samaritans, because, because of what she says in the following verses, that they, they too, the Samaritans, are looking for the Messiah. However, I don't know if the Samaritans practiced Judaism uh, to in the way that the, the the Jews practiced it, I don't know because they're only they're half Jew, half Gentile, and they're looked down upon the Jews. They're not they only can't associate with them. I'm assuming they can't even go into the temple uh, to do the normal things. They ask sacrifices, so 
I don't know exactly what kind of religious practices that they had, but at least we know from the coming verses that the Samaritans all looked for the Messiah to come just as the Jews did. Um, uh, before I go into the living water question, uh, what's your response to that? If, do you, can you help me with that? Well, wow, that's great, Brother Luke, because Scripture says uh, a lot about all those who are looking for His coming. It held true then, and it holds true now. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's always, you know, people looking, you know, for an answer. But, but yeah, you know, everybody was looking for the Messiah, you know, and here's, you know, Jesus is trying to, you know, show everybody that, you know, it's him. But overall, I really don't have too much to say about this as of right now. Well, maybe I'm nitpicking here, but you said everybody is looking for the Messiah. I'm, I know you're talking about that particular time and place, but but not everybody was looking. The Romans weren't. The Gentile world weren't. They weren't looking for a Messiah. So the fact that, that we know the Jews were, and now we, we also know the Samaritans were, but not everybody was. Uh, so that's why... I know that the Samaritans are kind of they're half Jew, so they, they, they do have that in common with them that okay, we still we do believe in the Messiah, he's gonna come. Uh, but how much Judaism do they practice? I I don't know. I guess you guys don't know or you would tell me. Um, the other question though is about the term living water. Uh, what comes to your mind? Anything about the living water? Well, um, well, one thing that I'm just looking at it right here. But the thing is, if I say what I was about to say, I would have, I would have jumped ahead in the verses. But when I think when I think of living water, I just think about the gift of you know everlasting life, you know, and that gift of salvation, you know, the gift that He promised to all of us for those who ask. Because I mean, that's what He's saying here. You know, you would have asked of him, and he would have given it to you. So it just all I think of about is just the gift, you know, of everlasting life, and of course, you know, salvation, and the Holy Spirit. You know, that's just just this is what this reminds me of. Okay. Uh, did Stephen take cuts? What's going on here? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, the living water. I believe uh, water was fashioned in the likeness of Jesus. We all need it, and we all like it. Okay, back to you. Hmm. Well, I thought you were going to associate water with the Trinity there when you said that. that and, you know, H2O, there's three parts. Again, it's just water. It's one thing. Um, some people use water to try to demonstrate the Trinity, um, but they really mistakenly are really expressing modalism. Uh, see, modalism means that uh, it's the belief that uh, there's one God, Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Son's the God, but not simultaneously as we do who believe in the Trinity or the triunity of the Godhead. Modalism believes that uh, God just changes forms. He's, he operates in the mode of the Father, and then he changes into the mode of the Son, and now he's no longer the Father, but then he operates in the mode of the Holy Spirit. So, so he just changes. It's like putting on a costume. Or, but the analogy with water that people use is that you have water, it's liquid, and then if you freeze it, it's ice, and if you heat it up and it melts and turns into a vapor, it's gas. So they think that they see there's that demonstrates the Trinity, but it doesn't demonstrate the Trinity because that demonstrates modalism. Um, because it's not all three at the same time; it changes from ice to water to gas. Um, whereas in the, those of us who believe in the Trinity, we believe that it's existing as ice, water, and gas all at the same time. <laughs> you know, but yet it's one. Um, but that's what I thought you were going to go with uh, the, when you start talking about water being like Jesus. But the living water term, what comes to my mind, 
Do you remember in the earlier study on John, we talked about um, born of water and born of the Spirit? You remember that verse? Uh, and we talked about then. Yes, that, yes I remember that. Yeah, and a lot of people think of, they think of when it says born of water and born of the Spirit, they think the first part, being born of water, they, there's only two ways I've ever heard people def, uh, explain it. One is born of water is like the physical birth when you come out of your mother or she, and she, her water breaks and she goes birth. They think it's a picture of the physical birth. Uh, other, other people think that born of water means that you have to get water baptized. Um, the, but I, but I, I associate born of water with this verse we're on right now, living water. Uh, this living water that Jesus has, it's, it's the, the living water that you get by putting your faith in Jesus. Another thing to associate with it is uh, we know that there's a river that runs through heaven, uh, and, and, and that has living water in it, doesn't it? How, how, is that def, how is that explained and defined, the water, the, the river that runs through heaven? I, I forgot exactly the, the term, the, the way it's described. Um, let me get your response to that before we go on. Oh, Brother Luke, uh, this is the first I've heard of this. Uh, I really can't comment on something so uh, theologically deep at this time. Okay, back to you. Hmm. I never really heard about, you know, the um, being born of water as being given the, um, what is it, the living water. I never drew those two together. I think that's a pretty, you know... But at the same time, you know, I can see that connection though. So I feel like it was a definitely a really good point to add to this. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let me read this section here in the Amplified. We have we haven't even gotten to the Amplified yet on that these verses. Let me see. Verse ten. It says, uh, uh, "Jesus answered her." If you knew about God's gift of eternal life and who it is who says, give me a drink, you would have asked him instead, and he would have given you living water, which is eternal life. So that was, a, that was quite a talk just about one verse, I guess. There's a, as I said, there, there's a lot of great concepts in that one verse. I'll go on to verse 11 now. In the KJV, it says, The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living, that living water? Uh, art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? I read verse 11 and 12, um, but... Let me ask you something uh, in a broader sense rather than specifics in the verse, but you, you've noticed, I'm sure, in a way we could say that she's a little dense. Uh, we could say the same thing about the great man Nicodemus. He seemed a little dense. Uh, when he had a conversation, when he had a conversation with, with, uh, um, Jesus, Jesus was like, you know, why don't you understand this? And now, with same thing with her, he's telling her things, and she doesn't understand it. And and why is it that Nicodemus and this uh, uh, this Samaritan woman seem to be dense and don't understand what he's saying? Now, let me give, let me ask you just to address that one part of it. Yes. Okay. All right, I guess I'll go first. I'm used to letting Eric go first, but all right. Well, looking at, you know, verse 11 here, um, you know, both her and, you know, Nicodemus, they took, you know, 
when you say dense, it just makes me think of, you know, they took it, you know, very, you know, literally, like from like the earthly standpoint, because at this point, you know, it's, she doesn't, you know, they just didn't understand at that point, you know, at that specific moment in time when Jesus first, you know, gives them the analogy, like when he first gives Nicodemus born again, he doesn't understand what that means. Not at least not at that moment he didn't. And then this woman at this time doesn't understand the concept of the you know the living water at the time. So right now she's thinking of, you know, you know, like how do I do this? Like how do I do this literally? Like where do I drink this? And like like how are you gonna give it to me? And then, you know, while Nicodemus was like, Well, how am I gonna, you know, shove myself back into like my mother's womb? Like they're both thinking about it in such the literal way, instead of thinking about it like in the you know, spiritual way, as Jesus says, you know, that it's a gift. And just at that point, you know, it's as I said in an earlier comment. At this point, they didn't have the eyes to see at this point. I mean, that changes, but at this particular moment, for both of them, they just didn't see it at the time. Yeah, that's, that's what I was looking for, that answer there. Um, Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman are, are basically they're kind of they're in the flesh. They're not thinking in a spiritual way. Uh, and that, I think Jesus said to Nicodemus, uh, "How you can how can you understand spiritual things if you don't understand this?" Uh, and of course, uh, when we get the Holy Spirit, that's why one of the reasons that uh, we understand the, the scriptures better is when we put our faith in Jesus. We get the Holy Spirit in us, and we now we can see things through spiritual eyes instead of through the flesh. So we we see things that we never would have seen before. And she's at that point where she doesn't think in a spiritual way, just like Nicodemus wasn't. Uh, Brother Eric, anything on that before we? Uh... Hey guys, uh, sorry to be uh, dozing off on you like that, uh, but. Uh... Uh, can I just accidentally un uh, unplug my monitor? Can you guys still see me? Yeah, everything's fine. Okay, uh, I'm gonna have to reach back under there and plug my monitor back in, but I I can still go ahead and comment. Uh, we can see you and hear you perfectly. There's no need to do anything. Okay, I agree with you guys. Good call on that. Uh, they were definitely uh uh. Walking in the flesh, but uh, that's only natural, isn't it? Okay, uh, I won't be able to mute my volume until I plug in my monitor, so uh, I might be kicking up a little bit of noise here for a second. Okay, I just muted you on my end. Okay, uh, let me see. Uh, Okay, so the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast draw nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then shall hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and cattle? Uh, Brother Eric? Uh, I think you muted him. I got yeah. it. Okay, all right, go ahead. Okay. I'm thinking uh, Jesus probably knew exactly what she was going to say before she said it. So uh, we could probably go over this with a fine-tooth comb and learn, glean a lot from it on uh, what was actually being said and what was actually going on here. And uh, I guess that's what we're doing now. Okay. I don't really have any additional comments at this time, except just looking at the. Um, all right, turn my camera on. But just looking at you know, are thou greater than you know our father Jacob? You know, which gave us this well and drank thereof. You know, it's just it's at the time she just doesn't understand. You know, who she's talking to. You know, because this is you know God in the flesh. You know, the Messiah. While you know Jacob was a you know. He was a big figure. I mean, he was definitely important, but nothing in comparison, you know, to Jesus. It's just, just doesn't understand at this time. But I know the next verse is going to be really awesome. 
All right, I'll read it in the Amplified, see what it says here, for, still for verse 11. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, no bucket and rope, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and who used uh, to drink from it himself and his sons and his cattle also? There is a footnote here on the word Jacob. Let me look and see what it says. E says, Jacob renamed Israel, that was the son of Isaac. Okay, we know that. All right, uh, we'll, we'll go on to the next verse in the, in the KJV now. It's verse uh, 12. No, 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in, a, in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. All right, you've been waiting to talk about it. Go ahead. All right. Well, at this point, you know, he says, you know, who will drink of this water will thirst again. Well, so he, at this point, you know, he's talking about, you know, this literal water, you know, that's in front of you. Although you could also technically say, you know, it talks about it in a spiritual way because he, when it, cause it does say thirst again. So which means you're still going to be, you know, thirsty for the truth because you wouldn't have found it at that point. Although, of course, I have to say that this mostly talks about just the literal water here. But then he says, whoever drinks the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water, you know, will get, the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Because, you know, when you ask Jesus, you know, for salvation, and, you know, when you believe on him, I mean... You get the everlasting life, as it says right here in this verse, but also it says you shall never thirst, which means you'll never be left, you know, wanting and, you know, and desire and like just trying to get, you know, salvation or ever trying to get it again because you'll have the assurance of it at this point because Jesus gives you, you know, blessed assurance, you know, in him for everlasting life. So like... Whoever drinketh of the water that he gives you has the gift. You have everlasting life, and not only that, but you're sealed and you have security, and you'll never, you know, you'll never thirst again because you won't ever have to. He'll have given you everything you need, and it'll you'll never lose it. I like that very much. The way you uh, related to never thirsting again to eternal security and, and assurance. Uh, I, I think you did really excellent uh, making that point. Uh, now, when we do talk well, about... Go ahead and say uh, that was brilliant. Uh, this verse refutes uh, any other point of view than Osis, logically. Okay, back to you. Sorry to interrupt you. That's all right. Uh, well, we're, we're getting near the close of the broadcast where we're going to start talking about how to how to get this living water here that Jesus is referring to. I'll let Brother Stephen elaborate on it a little bit, but, but first the, uh, um, the, the living water, there, a lot of people like to uh, make the point that receiving the promise of going to heaven now, when I say uh, that you're going to go to heaven, that means that you got salvation because you're saved from going from hell to hell, and it means that you got eternal life because you're going to live in heaven forever. Uh, so, uh, when people think about, uh, we tell you, well, this is this is what you need to do to go to heaven, and we we tell you it's like it's like walking through a door. It's like eating a piece of bread, it's like taking a drink of water. A lot of people have used these illustrations. These are biblical illustrations. Jesus is using the illustration right here with a woman about just drinking water, how easy it is. And uh, so 
the, the problem is that uh, most people in the world today, they don't understand what, what we would call easy believism, easy salvation. Uh, the good news that salvation is a free gift, that you don't have to work your way to heaven, you don't have to earn it. You don't and through through uh, you know uh, do, you don't deserve have to be good and deserve it because of personal merit. Uh, in fact, none of those ways can work. You, they, you know they're all doomed to failure. But but it's just as easy as walking through a door, drinking water. Uh, that's how easy it is to get into heaven. Um, so I think that this is a perfect illustration here. But also the idea that. Uh, you never thirst again. To me, if a person doesn't have the assurance and they have the fear that they're going to lose their salvation, then they never really understood what salvation is correctly. Maybe they did at one point and they got confused later, but if a person is doubting their, their eternal security and worried about losing their salvation, um, that's a very, very sad thing. There probably are some truly saved people. They believed on Jesus. They got salvation, and they believed they were saved. And then later on, people teach them things, and they get start getting doubts and fears and worries. And that's a sad thing when a, a, a Christian worries that might they might not go to heaven. Um, so I think that that living water and never thirsting again, I didn't really use that verse to make the point until tonight I, I saw it so I thank you brother Stephen for making that point and, and uh, if someone's watching right now and uh, you're saying well this is really interesting and I, 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 I do want to go to heaven I, the amazing thing is that I've asked a lot of people this question do you want to go to heaven when you die and and uh, you get a mixed reactions some people say well, I don't believe in heaven I don't believe in hell I don't believe in any of that or some people say Oh, no, I don't want to go to heaven. I want to go to hell. That's where my friends are going to be. <laughs> you know, well, fine. If you don't want to go to heaven, that's okay. You can turn this off if you want. It doesn't matter to me if you want to go or not. But if you're, but if you're somebody that says, yes, I want to go to heaven. Well, right now we're going to tell you how to, how you can go to heaven. The one way you can go to heaven. Brother Stephen. <sighs> All right. Well, I mean, as we just discussed, and this is a good transition into it. You know, Jesus said, you know, if you knew who it was that said to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee, you know, living water. And he said that whoever drinks the living water will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up to everlasting life. Well, the answer is Jesus is the living water. Jesus, you know, as he also says, is the bread of life, and he is the only way, you know, to heaven. As it says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is no other way to go to Jesus except, I mean, sorry, there's no other way to go to heaven but by Jesus. Not by your own merit, not by any religion, or by anything. Just one, you know, verse that I also like to say is Galatians 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. There is no other way to be saved. I mean, there's no way that you can ever do it by your own merit or by obeying the law or just being righteous by your own account because it's going to fall short because your works of your own type are as filthy rags in front of God. You know, all of us, you know, there's no, no one righteous, not one. And none of us deserve the gift of eternal life. We all deserve to go to hell. But there's good news. Jesus, you know, being fully man, fully God, God in the flesh, came here to this earth. He lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. He fulfilled the law. He was pleasing to God. But then, besides all that, he also performed miracles that proved who he was. But then he did the ultimate thing and paid the ultimate price for us. And he paid it all by doing this. He gave his own life for us. He died in arguably the most excruciating and painful way possible of that time, in humiliating way. He died on the cross 
You know, he shed his blood for you. He was buried. But then three days later, he rose again. And when he did that, he proved who he was. But when he died on the cross and shed his blood, he paid the price, which was death, which is what we deserve. As it says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, when it talks about death, it, in this sense, it talks about the second death. But Jesus tasted death as God, and he didn't have to. But he did this to give us the gift, which is eternal life through him. You know, for as it says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus paid it all for you, and there's no other way, not by the right, but not by your own righteousness, not by any works, not by any other religion or anything. Only through Jesus can we be saved. And, you know, he proved who he was. So all you have to do, you know, as he was talking, you know, tonight to this woman, well, talking back then as we talked about tonight, all you have to do is just come to him. Come to him and put your faith and trust in him. And, you know, just ask and he'll give it to you. And just put your faith in him and trust in him. And that's all you have to do. For as it, Jesus says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I mean, don't try to save yourself and don't try to like do any works or anything. Just simply come to the just come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and believe. He'll give you salvation. He, you know, he'll give you eternal life. And he'll give you, you know, security in him, strength, and he'll give you his Holy Spirit all in one shot. And all you have to do is just believe. It's very simple. And, you know, and I wouldn't say wait either because that's, you know, today is the day of salvation. You don't know if tonight's your last night, you know, or not. So I would encourage everybody here, come to Jesus tonight. Come, believe on him. And have rest and be saved. And that's all I have about this. All right, well done. Um, I'm I'm uh, having my icon on the screen right now rather than my camera because I, I want you to look at that icon and think about what it means. That uh, um, if that's you reaching up, uh, Jesus is reaching out and he he wants to embrace you and he wants to hold you in the palm of his hand the Bible says when he, he holds you in the palm of his hand no one can pluck you out it says that he will never leave you or forsake you so uh, this person reaching out to Jesus they could make a choice of saying I don't need Jesus I'll do it on my own or you could make the decision I can't do it on my own I need Jesus to save me. And if that's if that's you right now, reach out to him, trust him, and he'll pull you up. He'll get you to heaven. Rely on him to take you to heaven. And uh, he will do it. He is faithful. Um, okay. Uh, I want to give the last word to uh, Brother Eric. Now, a person does not have to say some prayer in order to get saved. Uh, you get saved even before you can say a prayer. If you believe in Jesus, if, if right now you listen to us and you say, oh, I believe in Jesus, I believe, you believe that you, you need him and you're, you're tr going to trust him, at the moment you believe, you're saved right then. So some people teach you you have to say a prayer and that's what saves you. But uh, Brother Eric wants to tell you a prayer, but it's not to get saved. It's a prayer of thanksgiving. Uh, recognizing and showing, telling Jesus your appreciation. So I'll leave that to Brother Eric now. Amen, Brother Luke. Uh, when Jesus healed the ten lepers, only one came back to thank him. And Jesus said, where are the nine? And we don't want you to be among the nine that were ungrateful. And if so, if you would like to thank Jesus, for his great gift of salvation that you have received, then pray with me this prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and being buried and rising the third day. 
so I can live for you, with you forever in paradise, eternal life in Jesus Christ. We receive it. Amen. Okay. All right. Um, well done, brothers. Um, thank you for participating uh, tonight. We'll pick up uh, where we left off uh, next time. Uh, I enjoyed this very much. Uh, if you're watching the video live, I, I thank you for joining us live. Uh, I, I hope that uh, you can join us nightly live, 7 p.m. Pacific time. And bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.